So, go to Revelation 21.3. And uh, most of the notes in uh, Peter, S., uh, Peter Sturgis uh, Rockman uh, Reference Bible, amen, Appendix 40. <laughs> you should do it with the Schofield Bible page. But anyway, if you're in Revelations chapter 21, we're going to uh, continue uh, a little bit in, in not in the, the main three, body, soul, and spirit, but I want you to see about New Jerusalem today a little bit and uh, what that entails and how you need a Bible to clear everything up. Because if you don't use your Bible, what it says, then you're going to go on whatever a preacher said or what you think is right. And it'd be, it'd be really be a bummer for you if you got all mad at everybody and you found out when you read your Bible it wasn't so. So it's really good to read your Bible. And if it's clear, you take it. You know, if it's not clear, you just going to have to surmise, I guess, for a while. But uh, it's very important that you understand this about New Jerusalem, that you have an inorganic and organic. There's a couple things involved here in New Jerusalem. And uh, that's why there's a lot of confusion sometimes in commentaries. But here in, in Revelation 21 <clears throat> and verse 3, uh, <clears throat> it says this. Well, we'll just start in verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now, did he see it? That's what it says, right? He saw it. Just, you know, I always remember these little things like he saw something, okay? Because uh, there's a reason I'm saying this, because pantheism is, is getting popular again. I mean, uh, pantheism where there's gods and everything. You know, you're sitting on that thing right there. You know, since it's made of atoms, naturally, some Christians are going to say it has to be God because all things consist by him. You know, next thing you know, you're going to be worshiping pews, you know. But anyway, let's read on here. It says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with who? is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So what a verse. So, but when you go into commentaries, there's not one, really, that discusses how a city can be a bride. Not one of them. You can go to, I got, I got, I got books. Got them at home, too. Got every commentary you can. There's not one. Even Sorison out of Wisconsin there. You know, he's supposed to be a King James Bible believer. You know, he don't correct, but he uses the Greek a lot. But he, when we studied Revelations, he sure didn't hit it. And so in verses 9 and 10 of uh, Revelations 21, <clears throat> I wonder what it says. It says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talk with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Verse 10. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So we're getting a picture here just from the Word of God, I hope. So a bride, as the bride of Jehovah and the bride of Jesus Christ, what are you talking about? Oh, there's, 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 there's more than one. And people miss this in the Bible. This is why your hyper-dispensationalists will say that there's no bride of Christ. There's just the bride in the Old Testament. You know what I mean? Then next thing you know, you have two lambs. Right, Krista? Now we got a couple lambs. And it gets so confusing even for them to try to explain that you would have to eliminate everything that has anything to do with the church, the body of Christ being involved in this. See, when it talks about the Lamb being present also, you know who's in the Lamb? We are. The Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And there's no contradiction with Scripture because there is a trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Enough preaching over the years. Most of you in here, you're, you're not young Christians. You heard about uh, Hosea. You heard about God divorcing somebody. In the Old Testament, and book of Hosea, and he was mad, and he was the husband of Israel. He just he says it himself. So you see, if he says that over there, 
And next thing you know, we've got the bride of Christ over here. If you're, you're eventually in your mind, you'd have to say, well, that's not really the bride of Christ. See, that's really the bride of Jehovah, an Old Testament thing. It's got nothing to do with us. I'm just saying this to you. If, if you're getting confused, good. You need to. Because it's garbage. But when they get on this, this, this thing, see, if I am a cell in the body of Christ, you know, we're all cells in there, it's real easy to be a Calvinist. It really is. If you start taking away New Jerusalem, you start taking away literal stuff, all right? You're going to have a problem later on. You really are. Where are you going to go in here? I mean, what, I mean where's the encouragement you're going to get? It's, it's like people, it's, it's like these people talking about we're going through the tribulation period. I mean, the very Bible says comfort yourselves with these words, you know, over there in, in, in Thessalonians about the rapture. So if you don't believe the rapture is going to happen, if you believe you're going through this, what kind of comfort is that? I mean, are you comfortable with your government right now? You know, it's getting worse. And you're going to be comforted going through the tribulation period? That makes this stuff look like, man, like child's play. No, I don't think so. So when you read your Bible, you read it as the very words of God. You read it in the context in which it's written. And you have to ask yourself, who in the world is it talking to at the time? And you've got to place yourself doctrinally, who is it talking to at the time? Because that's the way you read anything, you know? Who is he talking to? What is he saying? When is it happening? You know? And if you don't read your Bible like that, you can get, you can get pretty well confused. That's why a lot of times when um, people get doubts of their salvation, I mean, all they've got to do is mess up outwardly one time, right? You mess up one time outwardly, and all you've got to do is hear a message on it that, that people saved don't do that, and you're going to go into the, to the, to the abyss, man. You're going to go into a deep depression and say, well, I've got to get saved again, so I won't do that again. And the next thing you know, you'll, you'll run through that whole thing again. You'll have a happy day or week. And next thing you know, boom, you're back doing that again. You start to figure things out or you don't. There's many people at these camp meetings, these tent meetings. I remember going to Parkview. I dealt with a guy 20 years that never got his salvation together. Yet he never missed church. And he was always around the people of God because he liked it. He liked preaching, liked it. But in his mind, he could never get assurance because he started doubting the Lord way back. And it's like you're calling God a liar. All right? So what you need to be is you need to be reinforced with Scripture. You need to understand that there's a difference before the cross and after the cross. You need to know that when we have the Lord's Supper here, and you take the Lord's, you get the cup. He says, this is the cup in my what? Well, how's that work? This is the cup of... Anybody know what we say? Huh? Yes, yes. So it's close. Blood what? Does it mention New Testament in there anywhere? Did Jesus ever mention anything about the New Testament? Oh, because he, he sort of knew that a testament has to have a testator. And a testator's got to die before it becomes a testament. And that's in Hebrews. So why would you go before he died? And the whole ministry was to the nation of Israel. And you go fit your body in there, doctrinally, you can get pretty messed up. Well, I'm telling you the truth. You will never get doubts. You'll never get doubts from the book of Romans all the way to Philemon. You never will. If you do, there's, you're, you're, you're weird. You have to talk to you about that. None of those ever got me doubting anything. But when I go to camp meet, when I get some heavy-duty preaching coming in, and if they start doing that stuff, it's good to rock your boat and to assure yourself and to get cleaned up and repent. But, man, if somebody gives you doubts, and you better check that out. You better go back somewhere and assure yourself somewhere that you really got saved, right? Number one, there was a place and a time when you did what you were supposed to do. And then after that, you mark it down that the devil's trying to get your head. And a lot of Christians are out there back in the bars because they, they just can't please. They, just, they think they can't please him like, like it's a whole lot of stuff they're going to do. You cannot even live this Christian life without God. If God's not in you, listen, if, if, if God is not in you, empowering you to give victory, you ain't making it. That is the Christian life. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Every person who's ever saved and backs them, when they come back, they know how that works. How'd they even come back? You know, how'd you get victory over whatever you got victory over? As soon as you say you did it, you got problems. God will show you who did it. 
You'll be back doing that thing 10, 20 times. I got people out there, whatever sin they went out, I'm telling you, they're worse than they ever been. And you sit them down, they'll cry like a baby when you talk to them. It's, it's weird, isn't it? But you don't want to be that weird. You don't want to get that far down there. So when we're talking about New Jerusalem here, we're just reading verses. And if it says somebody saw it, they saw it. If God says it is like a, like a bride adorned, you know, if it, if it says that, then that's where we're going. So later on, when you get here and other stuff, just remember, go to your Bible, read what the verses say about what we're studying. And if it's a gray area, well, your guess is probably good as mine. You know. Anyway, I just want to get through some of this because, you, you know, I'm rambling. I'm already, I'm already off base probably 30 different avenues here. So a bride as the bride of Jehovah and the bride of Christ. Go to Hosea 2. I mentioned this, but you need to have verses for this so that you know I'm not lying to you. Hosea chapter 2. You say, where is it? It's, it's, I know it's by Amos. It's by Andy. It's by the mother ones. I know that. I remember just seeing it. And, I, and as many years as I've had this Bible and I read, I still, even though my mind, I'll go through 66 books, and I still got a problem sometimes locating. I get like a brain freeze or something. But uh, in Hosea chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse uh, 14, just 14 to 20. I, uh, Hosea 2, 14 to 20. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. You say, what's going on here? It's a prophecy of Israel, of God regathering Israel during the thousand-year reign. God's going to do this. He really is. But we'll read on. Um, <clears throat> and I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. And as in the day when she came up out of the land of where? Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai, and shall call me no more Belai. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the falls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth. And will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee. See that? I will betroth thee. Now see, when you read this, I've got old timey books now. I haven't got some sort of Lord sermons where the guy's saying he, he completely removed Israel and put us as, this is the Christians. It, this is not the Christians. This is about Israel. We, we do not replace Israel. Israel has not gotten rid of because they, they so-called crucified Christ like the Catholic Church likes to say. No, 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 no. You mess with them, God's messing with you as a nation. We're not talking about individual hook-nosed charlatan Jews and pornography kings in Hollywood. We're not talking about it. We're talking about the nation of Israel, God's holy land over there. He made a covenant with Abraham, and it's, it's going to work. And here what we're seeing is him regathering and getting them together. Okay. Verse 19. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. All capitals there. And it shall come to pass in that day. You see that? That day. I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them, Art my people? And, thy, and they shall say, Thou art my what? God. Now see, you got to watch. If there's spiritual applications, that's what preaching comes into. But contextual and, and doctrinal, you got to watch that stuff. Because you got to ask yourself, was there anybody back there born again by the Spirit of God? And then you've got to get them verses and all the messages that you heard in your mind. You've got to go look through the Scripture and see if there's any of an account of any of that stuff, you know. Because you're going to have a problem. Because the Lord's going to come along and say, It's expedient for me to leave. Why, Lord? 
so that the Holy Ghost can come down. Oh, really? Yeah. He's here, but he's going to be in you. And the next thing you know, you got people waiting over here in Pentecost for something to happen. And then it happens. Then you got Peter saying, being born again, right? Not a credible seed, but incredible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You got the Lord in John 3 3 telling Nicodemus what's going to take place, right? Being born again by the Spirit, a spiritual birth. But there was no there was no indwelling and sealing until he went up. That's why it's that's why it's dangerous sometimes with this. And Baptists are, were notorious for we preach principles, we preach standards. We preach things uh, from any part of that Bible. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable. What's it profitable for? Reproof, right? For instruction, right? And uh, for what else? There's a third one. Reproof, instruction. Yeah. Yeah, two negatives and one positive. Right? And there's application, right? There's doctrinal application. There's spiritual application. Prophetical application. And a lot of times people miss that. And if you do, you're going to get caught up with all this stuff going on now with all these different... Even some Baptists are getting Reformed Baptists now. They're getting Calvinistic. They think they're bringing in the kingdom. And uh, we're at school with the Methodists. And, and they actually think... They think we're going to overpopulate the world if we don't do something. They're going to think, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to do all this stuff. You know, and these old black gals have got better sense than them. Well, won't those wars and them diseases probably kill most of them people for you? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's a good point. It is a good point. Like, like, like all of a sudden, where's God in all this? Did, did he say something in his Bible about what's going on down here? And you're a Christian. See, and so, so your kids, see, pretty soon that kind of Christianity will be acceptable. Probably even in public schools eventually. Because they'll get along with the Arabs, they'll get along with everybody and their mother. Because they believe everybody has a little divinity in them. They believe in that pantheism. We're going to get to that. And uh, what are we trying to study here? New Jerusalem. Why are we getting all crazy here? Because that's just where we're going to start. You're going to have so much stuff to think about. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Now you saw in Hosea talking about he was going to regather these people in that day. Remember that? Ephesians chapter 5. And Ephesians chapter 5, we got, uh, let's see, 25 to 32. Remember this one? Every time you get married, every time you get married. <laughs> After about 10th time, you ought to get, no, I'm, I'm just, Sorry. I know it's on tape. You guys chopped this up and make me sound like a heretic guy. I'm going to kill you. Okay. 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to who? Himself a what? Glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any, any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his wife and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now see, look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So what does this mean? This means when you got saved, you became one flesh with who? Jesus Christ. Right? That's what it says. Go to the Old Testament and find that. You know, nobody wants to ever talk about that. I mean, they just assume stuff, you know, happened. And I'm telling you, if you replace the stuff for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and you try to make it Christian, man, there's been people over, this, you know, hundreds of years that have been trying to do that. You'll get messed up. You get messed up every time. Because in your heart, you're going to think Israel's just, 
They're nothing. Because they have to get born again now, don't they? Don't they have to get born again like us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you see, when you start thinking that, when you belittle the nation of Israel, when you, when you start, start taking an unbiblical view of them, you start going down the wrong road. And you'll start hooking up with different people that believe that. And Reformed theology can lead you there. And a lot of these people that are getting, getting big now because we're constitutionalists and we're patriotic in our country and we don't want to lose these things, a lot of those people that think like us also don't believe Christ is coming back physically to set up his kingdom. They believe spiritually that it's going to, the spiritual aspect is going to grow so much in people and they're going to change it. There's a lot of doctrine out there. You, you would not believe. The same people are the ones that would kill us. Those same people really hate the fact that we had that much liberty put in our Constitution also. And they would love a theocracy on this planet, right? You know, that they would, that they would cause. And so their mindset goes back to Rome, no matter what you say. If they come out of Rome... Their mindset set still has that, that deal to go back to them, just to refine it. See, we weren't part of that. We're Bible believers. Everybody understand that part? But that's what's going on. I mean, if, if you watch Fox News, what do you got? you got? You got Pope City on there, man. It's Vatican Central. I mean, it really is. I watch it, you know, and I'm watching, I'm saying. And then and the next thing you know, when the Pope does something, say, oh, the Holy Father. You know, like, you know, the Holy Father is, I'm saying. Yeah, you too. Yeah, even Sean Hannity, big one. Let not your heart be troubled. Yeah, Sean, why don't you finish it? You believe in God, believe also in me, right? You ought to finish that. You know, it's talking about Jesus said that, not the Pope. And I told you before, get ready for that black Pope, amen? This is exciting times we're living. But anyway, if you, if you in 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 the multitude of words why not sin and your preacher has a way of just talking all the time because I love to talk and we're talking about new jerusalem actually really coming down and we want we want people to understand that the people that are in new jerusalem okay that there's a lamb in there and and, and we're associated with the lamb and the more you read you're going to find out that you don't see us plowing you don't, you don't see the church down there having any, ask, having any control over the land. Like they try to say we are. No, 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 no. We're in Christ Jesus. You understand that? He is ruling and reigning. There's going to be actual people, Jewish people, that are going to repopulate. I mean, they really are. All the promises are to the land. To them in the Old Testament, not to us. See, we get it's sort of a neat thing right now because you, we can pray and we got Abraham, you know, spiritually speaking. And, and, if, and if we do what we're supposed to do, we're going to get blessings down here too. But that's not, that's not our main thing. Our main thing's up there with Christ, ruling and reigning with Christ. And we're going to find out there's a difference. There's a difference between us and them. And it's a good thing. But we're both going to be able to go into New Jerusalem. And the people that are here that are not Abraham's seed, they're going to bring gifts and everything into there. Yeah, they're going to come in. Matter of fact, there's going to be some trees growing, and the leaves of those trees are going to heal the nations. That's during a thousand years. See, God's got a provision for them physically, is what I'm saying. Because you do know there's going to be some people that didn't take the mark. There's going to be some people that were friends of the nation of Israel. You know, God's going to have mercy on some people. You actually know that they're going, they're going to come through, right? I mean, you have read your Bible. It's not like us beam me up, Scotty, and we're we're up there, and we're, you know we're, we're we got our we got our new body. Didn't, didn't the Bible doesn't the Bible say we got a new body, fashioned like His glorious body? Where's the hook nosed Jew that ain't born again in the Spirit of God got? I don't find that in there. Oh, but preacher. No, no, no. You ain't getting me on that path. No, 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 no. If he gets born again by the Spirit of God, business will pick up. If he dies without Christ right now, oh, boy. But did God promise Israel? Are they going to have a remnant that's going to believe? Yeah. 
in Ezekiel, I think it's 37, is there going to be a valley of dry bones and, and, and all of a sudden there's going to be a resurrection there? Yeah, do Jews believe that? Yeah. Real Jews believe that. They really do. Is David going to be at real David going to be on the throne too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we think about this, and we think about what it said, though, you know, in, in, in how it uh, personifies, uh, New Jerusalem personifies uh, an individual. And we, we say, oh, my goodness, how does a golden city become a living person? You know, we just think about that sometimes. The explanation reaches far back into the origins of man. It is the natural tendency for all nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues, listen to me, to believe in some form of pantheism. In other words, God is in everything. And that has been the exact position of every theistic evolutionist since Darwin. That's from 1850 to 2008 and now, all the way till now. And before the time of Christ, according to uh, 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 800 uh, to 100 B.C., the Greek philosophers discussed this under uh, monads, M-O-N-A-D-S, and atoms, A-T-O-M-S. God was a first cause, the electric magnetic field, or the universe itself. Now, you can read a, a, a dozen scientific books and journals where the heavens do not declare the glory of God. But my Bible says that they do in Psalms 19.1. And I'm going somewhere with this. Because those books, what they say, if they're Christian, you know what they say? They say they are God. We're, I'm telling you, kids are in Christian schools and some of their curriculum, little things like that, kids growing up, right? Instead of believing the Word of God, they're off in the NIV or New, New English Trans or some, of, some other weird thing. And well, God made everything. He's in everything. See, that's God. No, it said the heavens declare the glory of God. It didn't say the heavens are God. So they declare a big difference, but our kids aren't going to get it. See, parents have to tell them that. When you look out there at flowers and you look out there at stars, and you you got to tell kids something, man. Say the stars, God created the stars. That's not God. God created the tree right there, but that's not God. It's an extension of his creation, but it's not God, you know. And you can demonstrate that by just, you know, crushing a, if you're cold hard, you can probably get a nice pretty rose, show your little girl that. See how nice it is, Elsa? And then go, <laughs> it's not God. You can't do that to God. Let me see that King James Bible and they light it on fire like they're going to kill God and I'm, I'm going to have a heart attack. <sighs> no, just get me another King James Bible. It's not God. God's word. And God's word ain't going to work without God's spirit. You can burn this all you want. You can burn my body. You ain't getting rid of God. But that is the feeling. That is the sense. So just so you can keep that in mind. And um, that this philosophy has been around. Our kids are being saturated with it, with cartoons on Sunday. I mean, and everything else that they get. So they have things have to be reinforced. Like I told you Sunday night. It, you can't, nobody can live in a capsule anymore. You, you can't have like a whole neighborhood that's clean. You just can't. You can go, you can go, I'm telling you, you can go to Alaska. And we've got missionaries that went way back with the mucklucks. And all of a sudden they find a satellite dish. You know, it's like a cartoon, it's like a cartoon strip. You, get, you got an igloo with a guy puts a, a, a it's, it's, oh yeah. Well, what can they pipe in there? Anything they want to pipe in there. It, see, it ain't, it, oh, I'm going to get away from everything. Well, if you do, you're going to have to really get away from everything. You know, then there's no hospitals, no doctors, and you're going to find out what's going to happen. Why? Because God said you're not supposed to get away from everything. God says you're in the world, just not of the world. So when it starts heating up and getting real bad, it's going to require a, a different kind of character in Christians. See, when they get saved over in these other countries like China or that, they already know they're going to die. I mean, they just, they just, as soon as they say, I do to Jesus, they know they're going to die. They're ready. Not he, they, because they, if they get caught, they're, they're dying. So when they, when they cross over, they cross over. Here, we got Laodicea. We don't want to think like that, but it is, man. It's, how hard you got it, you know, really. You're going to have mental stuff. A whole lot of that, that's hard. 
But if you succumb to it, nobody's going to know. You can hide a lot of that stuff. You know, you can walk around as a Christian, hide a lot of inside things that are wrong, and, and play it safe. You can do that till Jesus comes. Here, so far. But I think God is... Uh, I think God's thinning things out a little bit here and it's make it worse to where you're going to have to make a stand. Knowing you're going to make a stand, lose your job. How about they come take your kids? How about if they say uh, from one years old, uh, what, till five or six years old? If you're a Christian family, these kids have to come because we don't want you brainwashing them. You know, we, you know what I mean, Joy? No, but that can happen. Preacher, that's not going to happen. You, we shouldn't, you're making us, it's a negative thought pattern. I'm going to feel bad and have nightmares when I leave here today. I'm telling you, we got a president and we have a Senate, both Republican and Democrat, that have violated and did treacherous, treasonous acts with Bush. And nobody stopped them. And you're telling me that they just can't say and do what they want to do? I don't know what other people are preaching, but these people, you're, you're going, they're going to sleep out there as Christians. They're stupid. I mean, this, this is going to get heavy. It, it can be overnight. Be overnight. I pray it don't. That's what we're supposed to pray, right? Be merciful to us, God. We don't say, oh, God, give us this or that because we know what we deserve. We don't want what we deserve. We want mercy. We want mercy for our grandkids, our great-grandkids. We want a revival. Me personally, I got a hard time believing it's going to happen. I believe in... Individual revival, local church revival, community revival. National revival, I still got a little problem with it, but God does what he wants to do. And in the darkest hour, revival can come. So I still got a little bit of hope for that. I'll pray for that, but I just... I, eventually, we got to be part of this Bible that's going into this. I mean, it's history. It's, and as far as I know, I think we're... Man, I've never saw it on this wise before. Or history. But this guy. Good. <laughs> So that's interesting stuff. Yeah, where was I? Oh, yeah, Darwinism, Greek philosophers. Let's see. Mm hmm. They violate the word of God. Yep. The religious application of this delusion, okay, what delusion that everything's God, like pantheism, is taught by all popes as the fatherhood of God. They teach that and they still teach that. And they also teach not only the fatherhood of God, but the brotherhood of man. You do know the Knights of Columbus teach that. You know that the Masons teach that. I know, I know you know this stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, they all get along. You know, as long as you believe in the architect, everything's cool. Yeah. Okay. So, it's in religious pantheism, God is in all infidels, atheists, unbelievers, heretics, uh, Paterists, bank robbers, rapists, sadists, blasphemers, and mafia members, just like he is in all Christians. Yeah. That's what they believe a little bit. You know, he would have been a good guy if he wasn't a gangster. He'd have been a good guy if he didn't get drunk all the time. I mean, he'd have been a good guy, you know, on and on and on. But he helped so many people. You know how much money Capone gave to these, the orphanages and the, and the nunneries and the Catholic Church? You know how much Eichmann did? You know, you know what Hitler did over here? You know, they, they really had a nice thing in them. You know, and the people will say, yeah. I grew up in that mess, man. Oh, he's okay. He's got, listen, everybody's got a little good to him. You know, just watch him. No, he needs, he needs to have the junk beat the, he needs to have it beat out of him now. Oh, but, you know, he'll, he'll come, beat it now. He ain't got nothing in him that's good, stupid. You know. I mean, when they start, uh, you know, killing everything in your house, I mean, it's time to investigate a little bit. Where are the kids coming from? Because you may wake up with a couple stab wounds. You know, these people are letting these kids go crazy because this philosophy is behind it. 1 Corinthians 3.16, somehow we're going we're gonna to keep doing this and it's going to be New Jerusalem, all right? We'll work this out. We're going to get into the lively stones. We're going to get into this, you know, how it's built. We're going to, you know, it's just going to be beautiful. And then when we're all done and it's all said and done, we're going to walk out of here and we're going to say, boy, that was good. What did he say? You know, and you do that year after year and you, some of it sticks. You know, I have notes that I can go to, Okay. You know, 
So preachers always look like they're smart, but they read notes and stuff. Sometimes you forget that because they never say that. They want you to believe. I'm stupid. I'm just going to tell you. i got to borrow brains. And that's what I do. Amen. So over here in 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 3.16, let's see what it says in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Got to find 3.16. Okay. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth where? In you. Okay. And who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. Not to non-believers, but to believers. All right. And then the other uh, famous verse here, let me see, it's Colossians 127. You know, a lot of people talk about Herbert Noe in a lot of ways, and they, they don't understand half the stuff that he went through when he got a hold of this King James Bible. You, we're talking about a man that uh, had Greek down. He taught English, besides being a gentleman, you know, having a master's degree from Bob Jones. So all that formal education, being brought up under that, and then all of a sudden getting a hold of the King James Bible being the perfect Word of God, do you understand what he had to do? I mean, you know, when you really think about it, he had, he had to go against all that and the people behind it to make that kind of a stand. And he could be corrected. If, if you had, I remember having Reese in and, anyway, and Doc and all these other Bible believers would come in and everything. And I watched him sit there sometime and shake his head and go, and we'd get around the table. He says, he says, Bob, just listen, you guys. I taught this for 40 years. And I was wrong. And when you hear that, you're saying, well, my God, can anybody know anything? You read that Bible 40 years and you're wrong. And what he was saying was, his education went before the scriptures. He brought his whole education to the Bible. When you believe the Bible is the Word of God, it teaches you and straightens your education out. Me and George is going to Springfield or wherever that is, university up there. And all these birds that come in there, you can see they're intelligent. Uh, they're grammarians, you know, they, they got all this other stuff together. But when it comes to the Bible, they bring all this baggage to it. And, and they can't even explain the verse. And we're looking at, duh, you, can I raise my hand? What, what does it say? Yeah, well, most scholars, and they go through. My goodness, how can you? How can you get anything from God? You can't. They're either lost, or they're they're messed up, and they are messed up. You know, we sit here. It's like manifest. It's it's just like matter of fact. You know, or you don't know that. I mean, the the poor black folk that's in there. They understand. They pick up. And they're looking. They're scratching their scratching and And then they look at us because there's you know it's a little ray of hope. White hope in the class. And, uh, you know, because you can't shut up. You got to finally raise your hand and say, boop, boop, you know. And so here we are, right? You're coming to scriptures and you're finding out that there's something inside of us that wasn't there to begin with. And that's what this is about. So if you're coming in here and you're looking at these verses, and what was it? Chapter 3 and what verse was it? What did I say? What verse? 27? Huh? Colossians 1 what? Okay. And it says what? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is that? What is that? Which is Christ where? The hope of glory. So you're going to tell me that this mystery was revealed in the Old Testament, that it was going on? No. You know, Paul got seven revelations, right, of mysteries. I think we, did we cover that? I don't know. It probably will be coming. You got the mystery of the church. You got this mystery. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Remember that? But as you read Matthew, who went for Jesus? Gentiles. Right? The ones that believed. And then all of a sudden you get around uh, Mark where it shows him as a servant. 
and them Jews still <laughs> buy him, and he'll get somebody else. Another Gentile comes forward, right? All the way to where all of a sudden you don't hear nothing but about Gentiles and John. What was it mentioned? Remember, remember the, the centurion by the cross? Surely this is truly the Son of God. Well, all them Jews didn't get it. Did you know that, that uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ over and over again told his disciples that were ate with him, fellowship with him, saw the healing and everything, that he was going to die? And in three days, he was going to resurrect? He told them that? And did you know they didn't get it? And do you know I could take you to the book of Galatians? And the book, book of Galatians says people that don't get the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because the God of this world have blinded the lost? So you saying them guys was lost? No way, I ain't touching that. But something was different. They didn't get it. But then they got it. They got it afterwards. But you can't make it to heaven not getting it. According to the book of Romans... It's the power unto salvation. What is the gospel? It's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first. And also, or, yeah, to the Gentiles. See, there's so many differences. So as a Baptist, as a fundamental Baptist, if I try to shove everything and make everything fit, then the poor person in the pew, when they go out and they read it, they're so confused. They're saying, how do you get that? And you know what he'll say? What will the, what will the good pastor say? You need to go to Bible college. You get that Greek down. See, there's a lot of stuff in there you don't understand yet. Oh, okay. Then what I don't understand, I, I just have to wait till I get it, right? Yeah. So I don't, I'm not required to, like, be responsible for it, right? I don't know Greek. You know, why didn't people get burnt? Wanted that Bible in that plowman's voice. God knew what was going on. God knew it was going to be English-speaking people. And what a blessing to know that I have security as a believer. What a blessing to know that I have two natures. We're going to hit a little goth or two, you know. Some of these people act like you're just lost. There ain't, another, there ain't two natures. I remember, that's one thing I never got into. You know, does this guy have some good stuff? Yeah, he's got some good stuff. But like everything else, you know. You correct the book, you get a little funny. And last thing I remember, I was just going to go with this, with these people, you know, because it's like a call over at Galilean for that stuff. Everybody had to go, you know. We never did. That's why I probably didn't like us too much. But all of a sudden, we're just ready to go. And what happens? Well, his brother's got a harem going on over there, you know, on the campus and all that stuff. So they had to postpone it for one, one year, you know. But his brother never had to get saved again. I mean, you know, spiritually speaking, I mean... It's just too many contradictions can go on. If you mess with this book, it's going to mess with your mind. You know, if you if you can't handle Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8 together, you know, to find out, finally get a reprieve and 8, you know, there's no condemnation, there's no separation, like security to the believer. If you can't get a hold of chapter 6 where you're baptized into Christ, and we use those words as, as a type, as a figure when we baptize, right, to walk in newness of life. But that's talking about the Holy Spirit in you, if you read the context. And then 7... In order to understand that, you've got to have dual nature. That's a crazy chapter. When I first, when I was young and the Lord read that, it was like a tongue twister, like somebody had a rap song going on. You know, wanted to do the things I did, but couldn't do the things I would. And, you know, and all this stuff, you know what I'm saying? I think I, I think I understand that, but I don't get it. And I had somebody just verse by verse, real slow. Wow, that's what I'm going through. And who said that? Paul said that. And what did he say? Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of flesh? And who do you thank? Lord Jesus Christ. See, so there's a lot of stuff that's deep, but the deeper you get, it's almost like it's simple. As soon as you get it, it's like it's down. Okay, I understand now. Because even people that are backslidden, they know that they're doing wrong with the Lord, but they're not listening to the little, the, the, there's like an intuitive spirit. There's like a voice or something that, you know, and they just get, they get stupid. And if they're never taught the dual nature, what do you think is going to happen to them when they get out there? You know what they're going to come to the conclusion is? I'm not worthy. There's no way. I can't do it. Your kids, I got kids. They get in that mode. That's it. They could be saved, but they've been calling God a liar. God's not blessing them for that. 
And once you get out of that protection, out of the local church, away from people, it's bad. So what do you do? Well, people that are in, you pray for those that are out. And you don't stop. And you don't give up. Why? Who in the world are you to say that God give up on them? I'm 62, and it's, it's been, this year has been so rough on this preacher, showing me unconditional love from God, that I feel miserable like a worm that I didn't have enough mercy on people. Because when you read the Bible, God never puts anything on his children. You read the Bible about our Heavenly Father and our relationship, he always does stuff for us, not to us. And it's unconditional love. And that's heavy. Because everyone I thought wouldn't make it, not everyone, but most of them, boom, next thing you know they're making it. And then I get jealous. How dare them? You know how they lived, how they talked, how they acted. What were God blessing them for? Next thing I know, God starts showing me this elder brother over there, you know, thing, you know. Like, remember when the son come back? You know, all these messages start coming together and say, oh, that's you. <laughs> You're the elder brother. You just stayed by the stuff, didn't you? Yeah, you poor baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's getting all the good stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. But he's got all the baggage. So you don't know about that, do you? And you see, he's going to be more humble and be better for the Lord than you with your attitude. Because he's, he knows what this can do to you. And a lot of Christians don't know that. And that's where you become a Pharisee. Because if you don't know that, if you don't really think you can go that way, whew, that's why everybody usually says the old timers all say, but for the grace of God. You know, because they know what this is capable of doing. It, it can turn like that. One thing can hit you, and you'll be out. It's scary. You got all that preacher out of New Jerusalem? So far, yeah. Because we're trying to show you that God's not in everything. You know, he's in the third heaven. His Holy Spirit, he can be wherever he wants to be, whenever he wants to be, and he's all-powerful and all-knowing. But he creates things. And when he creates them, they're not God. He created us. We are children of his. But we are not God. And when we die, we're not going to be like Mormons and become gods. This is not Greek mythology. You know, but that's the direction that it's going. That's why the Mormons are going to get along with everybody. They're all going to, I'm telling you, it's coming now. It's really coming together for these people. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to at least get to, to the first paragraph. Okay, I got there, got there. Okay. And, and then we got to notice how the book gives you two alibis, two alibis to damn yourself. What do you mean? Go to Matthew 23, 9. You know what alibi is, right? Oh, but God. You know, that kind of thing. You ever try to negotiate with God? I mean, you know. Certain things have to change in your life. you got to eventually start to love God rather than fear Him. You know, that would help. And, uh, and when you do that, your prayer life will change a little bit. I mean, don't, don't you remember when you first went to work and how you tried to beat up everybody because they weren't saved and they weren't acting right? I mean, I do. It took me about, I don't know, five, six years. God says, shouldn't he be doing that? You know, I know he did it because I'm not smart enough thinking about it. And I'd be arguing in my head. Doing wrong me too. You know, are they lost? Yeah, how lost people act. I'm saying so what are you trying to do? Be a Catholic? Compel them all to come in? Make them all total, total you know, make them all Christians and they're not? Uh -huh. So I start reversing it. They come around me sometimes around over over at Hercules and everything, and they would uh, they would uh, they would say some things, and they say, "Oh, I'm sorry." And you know what I'd say? It's okay. You're doing what comes natural. You're lost, and walk away. And I'd no really, and I'd be just as as a heart attack. I'd be nice, not mean anymore. And you see these guys too. I remember Jay saying. Man, what would you say to him? Because all he could see was something and saw his countenance on this other guy that was walking down the, the catwalk on the machines and everything. I said, I said nothing bad to him. He goes, 
Well, it sounded like he cussed him out or something. I don't know. He looked so bad. And it dawned on me, man, that's better than that conviction. Oh, man, he had to go walk away and think about that one. Here he is a good Catholic and everything, right? And I'm over here saying, well, you know, you're lost. That's just what you do. And that's what I did about all that stuff. The dirty books or the alcohol, just nice. You know, they'd always say, oh, preacher, I'm sorry. Did you see that? So we started putting magnets in our lockers. I got pictures of that over there for 10 years. As soon as we opened up our lockers, I'm telling you what, business picked up in that thing. Everybody, it was just weird. You hear them cussing, damn, and coming in the back of the locker room, you know? And all of a sudden they come in while well, we're changing our lockers off, and all of a sudden you hear them, they just shut up. And we didn't make them do anything. Just something happens. Okay, Matthew 23, 9. Let's see what this says. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is where? In heaven. You see that now? See see that verse that they use? For the fatherhood of man. That's your excuse, isn't it? That's the only verse I can see like that that they use. Now let me see this other verse here. Hmm. Acts 17.26. Acts 17, 26. Because, you see, the people that believe this philosophy were after the completion of the Word of God, okay? It wasn't like all of a sudden, boom. I mean, we're talking about the Christian people that believe that, fatherhood of a man and uh, whatever that is, brotherhood of man and, and, and God's your father. So over here in Acts 17, and when, I, when I'm doing this, just giving you a verse here or there, it, I'm just showing you that you can get you can get probably many more verses on your own to prove, you know, to get against the argument. But here's here's the other one. Look at verse 26. And hath made of one blood, do you see that one? This is Loretta King's famous verse. All nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. But you'll never find the last part of that verse in any newspaper articles or anything. It's always the first one. We're all of what? See that? And hath made of one blood. So you take a couple verses like that, you got an excuse, right? Hey, we're all brothers and sisters. And God's the father of everybody. Because don't call no man father down here, but for our father's up there. There you go. Case closed. They got it together. Those are the things that they use. And you may have noticed how carefully people like Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, Rick Warren, I'll just throw Bill Gothard out there. Youth tension conflicts. <laughs> We're to obscure the clear lines between sinners who are dead in trespasses and sins and filled with the unholy ghost, according to Ephesians 2, 1 to 2. We'll see that in a minute. And sinners who have experienced a new birth and now have two natures instead of one. Now, what we'll do is we'll, I'm looking at the time, so we'll, we're going to stop here. And I'm going to try to come back to this to just to show you that the philosophies of Rick Warren, when you start getting into their, their, their doctrinal stance, you're going, to be, you're going to be amazed at how they don't understand the dual spirit at all. The dual, not the dual spirit, but the, the dual nature at all. It's either or. And they'll work on you like that. And that's why a lot of people that go through a lot of these conflicts have conflicts. Because all of a sudden they start searching and saying, well, am I saved? I think Miss Tantanella did that. She went, she went almost nuts. And she was at temple with us and all that. But once you get that, when you start getting too deep and you're thinking that I can't do this, be if, if you don't think that you have two natures, a divine and an old man, and somebody's trying to tell you that if you're saved, you know, this has been like killed, like, you know, you shouldn't be having it rule. You go nuts, man. Won't you? I mean, you, you did enough stuff today, the thinking and everything, to, to send you to hell. If you think about it, how holy were you today thinking? I ain't talking about Alfred stuff. I don't smoke no more. I don't drink. No, I'm talking about your inside. I mean, really. I mean, if we were, if we were playing that one. You know how many times we have to get saved today? I'm not doing that again. I can't do it. I didn't get doubts of my salvation. To a senior in college. I went to camp meetings all the time, listening to all sorts of weird stuff sometimes. And, uh, you know, and it took me three years, you know, hiding it, keeping it suppressed, you know. 
And, you know, and then going down and begging God, oh, please, please, please. And, you know, and here I am preaching that this is the word of God. I believe the word of God is the word of God. I believe it's the word of God without my emotions. I just believe what it says. Right? And here I'm going through all this, you know, emotional stuff. And the word of God's still here. The words are still on the page. And then God took me to the old-fashioned Romans Road down in my basement over on Tyreman. And I was reading the Romans Road, and I don't know why I was doing it. I was going to say, oh, maybe, maybe now. And all of a sudden, it was like a, a voice or something says, you want me to break through the ceiling maybe? You want a big light? What, you, want me, you want a loudspeaker? What do you want to know? You know, and then as soon as I, like, intuitively heard that, it was like then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit showed me, how did you leave the club? How did you get to where you are now? What in the world are you thinking about? I'm saying, boy, then I got under conviction saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God. Oh, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I mean, how in the world did I end up over here if it wasn't God? You know, your mind. If you're not in a doctrinal church that's preaching doctrine, you're going to be floating around. You're going to be up and down. You know? And so I thank God for the anchor. And I thank God when I look at a pew, it ain't God. God could be sitting there, but that's not God. I look at a beautiful tree, beautiful landscape. I see the handiwork of God. I don't see God. You know, I take that old axe or that chainsaw, cut them trees up. I don't hear nobody, help me, help me, help me. I don't hear that. I'm sorry. I'm not going to hear it. If I hear it, I'm going to have to check my medication. Now, these other people don't even take medication. They're going to be hearing it. Why? Because in the Old Testament... When they started making groves and statues and everything, inanimate objects, you know, things that are hard. And God says they, got ear, they, they have ears, but they can't hear. Eyes, you know, he's making fun of these heathen, but yet those heathens did hear something, did see something. Because it was the spirit with that stuff. There's an evil spirit. And that statue will talk in the tribulation. Just like Mary's crying somewhere, some statue. And they base their entire salvation on these kinds of acts because they don't have the book. That's why they want to get rid of us. See, because there's no way in America that we can be a superstitious people unless we remove this book. And once you're superstitious, you see what's happening already with people not understanding the power that the people have that put these jerks in there. We have enough power, enough people right now to kick them all out. I mean, we could rush it. And that military would be behind us. The good guys in Congress would be behind us, but nobody's got the... Oh, I can't say that. Anyway, there's, there's just a different spirit because people are fearing for their lives. They got no security. They, got no, they don't know where to go when they die. They'll do whatever they have to do to s secure their life, even if they have to give up the country because they, they're, they're afraid. They don't know where they're going. That's superstition. That's what the Catholics rule on that stuff. They got that down, you know. They create the witches and they kill them, right? That's what they do.